It is always risky to try to draw the portrait of the ideas and beliefs of a society at any point in its evolution. Contradictions and cross-currents defy generalization. The 1940s and the 1950s focused on the experts who provided scientific and psychological means to achieving personal well-being. The therapeutic approach that gained momentum during these years was geared toward helping people feel better about their place in the world rather than changing it. Americans were looking to professionals to tell them how to manage their lives. The tremendous popularity of Benjamin Spock's baby and child care reflects a reluctance to trust the shared wisdom of kin and community. In that brave new world which science is preparing for the housewife of the future, the young mother has apparently been forgotten. Almost nothing has been done to ease her lot by simplifying and improving the care of babies. When we decided to have another child, my wife and I felt that it was time to apply a little labor-saving invention and design to the problems of the nursery. We began by going over the disheartening schedule of the young mother, step by step. We asked only one question, is this practice important for the physical and psychological health of the baby? We tackled the first problem of warmth. The usual solution is to wrap the baby in a half a dozen layers of cloth, shirt, nightdress, sheet, blankets. This is never completely successful. The baby is likely to be found steaming in its own fluids or lying cold and uncovered. The discovery which pleased us most was that crying and fussing could always be stopped by slightly lowering the temperature. Remember that these advantages for the baby do not mean additional labor or attention on the part of the mother. On the contrary, there is an almost unbelievable saving in time and effort. We also enjoy the advantages of a fixed daily routine. Children's specialists are still not agreed as to whether the mother should watch the baby or the clock. But no one denies that a strict schedule saves time, for the mother can plan her day in advance and find time for relaxation or freedom for other activities. Before the baby was born, when we were still building the apparatus, some of the friends and acquaintances who had heard about what we proposed to do were rather shocked. Mechanical dishwashers, garbage disposers, air cleaners, and other labor-saving devices were all very fine, but a mechanical baby tender? That was carrying science too far. Since publication of this article in the Ladies' Home Journal in October 1945, several hundred babies have been reared in what is now known as an air crib. One early user, John M. Gray, sent a questionnaire to 73 couples who had used air cribs for 130 babies. All but three described the device as wonderful. I think Professor Skinner's baby compartment is a tremendously interesting idea. Naturally, it should be tried out first, scientifically, before it is adopted by the general public. Lieutenant Commander Leslie B. Homan, July 19, 1947. 
Skinner has given advice and assistance to a company that is going to bring out a commercial model of the box. It will probably be on the market later this year, selling for something over $200, which is a good deal cheaper than the cost of a crib, blankets, sheets, baby clothes, and so on. A pair of bright-eyed twins named Roy and Ray Hope celebrated their sixth birthday in Bloomington, Indiana this week. Their father, Henry Hope, head of Indiana University's Fine Arts Department, thought they might be physically precocious, to which Mrs. Hope retorted, that sounds like a father talking. Roy and Ray seemed disarmingly normal, and that was news, for they had spent the first 18 months of their lives in a Skinner baby box. As it turns out, the Hope twins got as many colds as the rest of the family because they were hauled out of the box many times a day and exposed to adult polluted air. No psychologist can say whether the box helped or harmed them because none has been asked. To their parents, it seems obvious that they're doing fine. Mrs. Hope's verdict? The box is a boon to mothers because it cuts down on laundry and bathing. D.F. Skinner advised parents that punishment had been shown to be ineffective. No punishment and unconditional positive regard soon became entrenched principles of humane American child rearing. However, unpleasant and unfounded rumors also circulated about Skinner's personal and family life regarding the baby box. Inaccurate stories began to circulate that they had suffered grievously as a result. Some rumors had it that they became mentally ill or committed suicide. This hungry pigeon is moving about more or less at random. Sometimes it turns its head to the left. When it does, we reinforce that movement by giving the pigeon access to a dish of grain. Yes, sir. Once the pigeon has been reinforced for a slight turn to the left, we can wait for it to turn a little further. By gradual steps, we can reach a stage at which the pigeon turns in a complete circle. The pigeon has learned to make the response because it has been reinforced for successive steps leading to the final pattern. By the 50s, behavior shaping was popular in psychology labs throughout the world. From this virtuoso performance by a University of Wichita pigeon, it's clear that Skinner has changed forever the dull lives of experimental pigeons and given new meaning to the expression bird brain. We're always controlled and always manipulated. I insist that people are controlled. But what they don't understand is that I don't believe that people control people, environments control people. One of Skinner's first clues that the human animal is also controlled by reinforcement was his discovery that a pigeon did not need a reward every time. He found that a pigeon will persist in pecking thousands of times to earn a single food pellet. In other words, the schedule of reinforcement could be varied. Newsweek, 1959. For six years, the Navy had kept its Project Orcon missile program in the secret file. The scientist in charge, psychologist B.F. Skinner of Harvard, did his part by keeping mum. But now, in the current issue of Naval Research Reviews, the wraps have finally been taken off, and Project Orcon, a plan to use pigeons to guide missiles to target, can be seen in all its bird brain ingenuity. The movement toward the consideration of studying mental internal states was dramatically reversed in the 1950s by the work of B.F. Skinner. In the 1950s, there was early experiments on psychotic and retarded persons, then on teaching machines, and then programmed instruction. In 1948, I began to write my fictional book, Walden II. It began simply as a description of a feasible design for community living. I received a steady trickle of letters from people who have read Walden II, want to know whether such a community has ever been established, and if so, how can they join? I have never designed and conducted an experiment because I felt I ought to do so, or to meet a deadline, or to pass a course, or to publish rather than perish. In general, my effects on other people have been far less important than my effects on rats and pigeons, or on people as experimental subjects. That is why I was able to work for almost 20 years with practically no professional recognition. 
People supported me, but not my line of work. Only my rats and pigeons supported that. My notebook dated August 5th, 1963. Last night, Deborah and I went to the Gardner Cox for some music in their garden. Afterwards, as I said goodnight, she motioned toward the young man who had conducted the music and said, You know, he thinks you are a terrible person. Teaching machines, a fascist.